Okay, just cut off again. Yeah, I think that should be enough. Thanks, thank you. All right, so we will begin with the wisdom books or the poetic books. Now, the correct way to do this would be to give a brief introduction about the poetic books, um, uh, talk about some of the main features of the poetic books and all of that. Uh, but then we are so short of time that you know maybe you can just read the introduction which is there in your apc pdf notes you know uh, where it gives us brief introduction about the poetic books we will instead directly get into the book of job um, because there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion regarding this book people have a superficial idea about the story of job but most believers have no clue what's going on in the book of Job. And so I thought it would be nice if I could try to summarize this book and explain what's actually going on, because this entire book is a series of speeches, long speeches, using big words. And most people do not like speeches, which is why nobody really reads the entire book in an orderly manner and you know attempts to grasp the end uh, the argument which is being presented so um, i thought it would be good if we can actually take a look at what is going on here in this book of job so you have speeches being made by job speeches are made by all of his three friends a speech is given by a fourth friend named elihu and then you have two speeches being given by god so you have a whole bunch of speeches given in this book of Job, and it is good to understand what is going on. Um, so we know the background. Background story, we, uh, we do understand. Um, Satan basically says to the Lord, the reason that people uh, worship you, the reason that people honor you and obey you is because you provide blessings. If you stop blessing people and if you stop benefiting them, they will not worship you. Indirectly, he's saying, are you worthy of worship, Lord? The only reason people are worshiping you is because of the benefits that they can get. So he's, in fact, um, you know, um, challenging the Lord and saying, you are not worthy of worship and people will not worship you just for your sake alone. So that is the challenge that Satan is throwing. And the Lord says, there are people on earth who will continue to worship me even if I take everything away because I am indeed worthy of worship. So that actually is the um, background uh, scenario. And so um, the Lord allows um, persecution and suffering to come into the life of Job uh, to, uh, to prove to the principalities and powers that Job will continue to stay loyal and faithful in spite of everything uh, you know that happens in his life. Even though all the blessings have been withdrawn, he will continue to um, uh, believe in God. All right, so that's that is what the Lord wants to prove. And so we see um, his wealth being taken away, and then uh, his uh, family is also killed. And he himself, his health is affected. 
and so everything that he had he loses it all uh, in an in, in one single day and uh, so at the end of it in chapters 1 and 2 you know immediately after this uh, this crisis comes upon him job he says the lord has taken uh, the lord has given and the lord has taken away you know um, uh, blessed be the name of the lord and so he and it goes on to say over there in that verse he did not sin against the lord he did not curse the lord in any way okay so that is his attitude at the very beginning but then as the book of job progresses we see him growing confused he starts growing bitter he starts questioning god he starts saying many many things so it helps for us to kind of take a look at what actually goes on through all of these long speeches which are there in the book of job so uh, we 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 learn that three of his friends they come from other places you know just over here to comfort him to sit with him to be with him and they want to help him so they basic argument is that you must have done some horrible sin that is why god is allowing all of this to happen to you why don't you confess and repent if you do that then god will give you back your health you will get back your prosperity so confess the wrong thing which you have done and job keeps saying i have not done anything wrong and uh, you know so um, the speeches are basically revolve around this uh, basic uh, argument so the first speech is given by the first friend eliphaz okay so eliphaz um, just to use a few sample verses uh, you know job 47 where uh, you know eliphaz says to job he says consider now who being innocent has ever perished where were the upright ever destroyed you know is elif is what eliphaz says you know, just he says think about it god doesn't go destroying the righteous people it's the wicked which he destroys which means you must have done something evil uh, so he says in 517 job 517 he says uh, do not despise the discipline of the almighty so he says you know repent of whatever you have done and then now uh, um, chapter 22 verse 23 he says if you return to the almighty you will be restored if you remove wickedness far from your tent you know so um, so he he is convinced that eliphaz is convinced that job must have committed something uh, sinful to be undergoing this kind of suffering now job's response is initially this this is what job says in job chapter 6 verse 24 he says teach me and i will be quiet show me where i have been wrong you people you people are saying that i have sinned in some way so point it out to me if i have done something sinful kindly you know uh, specifically tell me this is what you have done because of this sinful action all of the suffering has come upon you so job throws a challenge and he says tell me tell me what sin have i committed because he knows that he has been really trying very very sincerely to follow the ways of the lord all right so um the second friend bildad he starts um his speech he is not able to point out any specific sins but he tries to bring a long argument explaining that suffering only comes to evil people so just to use one sample verse uh, job 18 verses 19 to 21 um this is what he says he says you know the wicked person does uh, has no offspring or descendants among his people no survivor where once he lived in other words he is saying you know what happens to the wicked people their children are destroyed they don't have any descendants left and that is what has happened to you you lost all your children which means you must have done something sinful that is why this terrible you know evil has come upon you and he goes on to say surely such is the dwelling of an evil man such is the place of one who does not know god so bildad is saying it looks like you don't really know god you've been saying that you have a relationship with god but 
the way you have lost your family the things which have happened to you it looks like as if you don't really know god because the evil who do not the evil people who do not know the lord such things happen to them okay so that is his argument coming to the third friend okay third friend so far um he talks about how the wicked will not prosper uh, so that would be job chapter 20 Verses twenty-seven to twenty-nine. If someone can read out for us, Job twenty verses twenty-seven to twenty-nine. The heaven will expose his guilt. The earth will rise up against him, and God will carry off his troubles, rising water to drink out his rain. Such is the hand of the Lord to the wicked. The heritage shall wander out of our land by God. Yeah. So in uh, verse twenty-eight, he says, "Yeah, you know." Um, okay. In verse twenty-seven, he says, "God exposes the guilt of those who do something sinful." So indirectly, he is saying, "Maybe you have committed some hidden sin, but God is the one who exposes the guilt of the wicked." In fact, what happens to them? He says in uh, verse twenty-eight, he says, "A flood will carry off his house." Oh, of course, in Job's case, it is not a flood which destroys the house; it is strong winds which come and the you know the house uh, collapses. Uh, so he says, "Such is the fate God allots the wicked, the heritage appointed for them by God." So all the three friends basically are having are basically saying the same thing in different words. They have long speeches in which they explain how very, very bad things happen to the wicked people, and God punishes them. On the other hand, God blesses the righteous. God rewards the righteous. He watches over the righteous. So, therefore, Job must have done something wrong, and that is the reason why he is suffering. Uh, so, coming to Job and his speeches, this is what we see uh, in Job chapter one. Verse twenty to twenty-two. That is where he makes his initial statement of faith. Okay, so the those are very beautiful verses uh, where he just submits to the Lord, uh, submits to what has happened, and he says, you "No, know, the Lord uh, is worthy of worship. The Lord is worthy of praise." Uh, maybe we can actually read out those verses. Job chapter one, verses twenty up to twenty-two. Job was not a man of small action. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, "Naked I am from my mother's womb, and naked I shall be buried. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised." And uh, the word next verse twenty-two. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job did not charge God with wrongdoing. He did not say, "Lord, what you did, it is wrong." He does not say that. Rather, he says, "God is good. God only does what is right. So God's name should be praised. If the Lord chooses to take away, there must be some purpose for it." So you know, he does not charge God with wrongdoing. Um, but then, when the when the friends go on saying again and again. now uh, these things happen only to wicked people and so you must have committed some wickedness and they go on pressurizing him they go on persecuting him when they do that he starts questioning himself his first response is he starts thinking um it's true that i am not perfect you know because all of us we commit sin you know uh, in some way or the other but his argument is shouldn't god forgive me of my sins you know when i go to him humbly and i repent of my sins shouldn't the lord just forgive me why is the lord persecuting me when i have always been very very careful to repent of my wrong doings you know so uh, this is what it says about job job chapter 1 verse 1 this is how job is described it says this man was blameless and upright he feared god and shunned evil so he was blameless and upright in the sense 
whenever god pointed out his mistakes to him he was humble enough to immediately accept and admit and say yes lord what you are saying is correct what i did was wrong what i did was sinful i repent of what i have done lord please forgive me he was always very very quick to repent of the wrong that was done by him you know in fact he he is willing to make sacrifices even on behalf of his children because we see in chapter 1 verses 4 to 5 whenever his children would have a large feast it says in uh, verse 5 it says job would make arrangements for them to be purified early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them you know just in case they have committed some sin so here is a man who understands that the way to maintain a blameless relationship with god is to always be watchful and the minute the lord points out something sinful in your life rather than arguing with the lord the right attitude is to immediately confess and say yes lord what you're saying is right and i have sinned what i have done is sinful and i repent so this was the attitude of job throughout his life and so he he tries to reason with god he tries to explain to god lord it's true that i am not perfect but lord shouldn't you be forgiving which is you know which which is his first attempt of trying to grapple with the situation so the first thing that he does is he tries to explain to god reason with god talk to god about his situation and um this is what he says in job chapter 7 verses 17 to 19 he says what is mankind that you make so much of them that you give them so much attention now you know this reminds us of a psalm psalm 84 there the psalmist says what is mankind that you are mindful of them human beings that you care for them in psalm 84 the wording is positive the psalmist is saying lord we are just humans but you spend so much of your mind thinking about us caring for us looking after us what are humans that you pay so much attention to us and so the psalmist talks about it in such a positive manner here job on the other hand he says what are humans that you you know that you pay so much attention to us constantly testing us constantly examining us obviously if the lord starts examining us he's going to find a hundred defects you know because we are just human we are not perfect and so you know he says uh, in job chapter 7 verses 20 to 21 he says why have you made me your target and he says in uh, verse uh, 21 why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins so he when all these friends keep saying oh you must have done something bad you must be hiding some unforgiven sin he he basically says to the lord it's true lord i'm not perfect but lord i have always tried to repent so why are you not forgiving me why are you allowing this persecution to come upon me okay is is the first step where he tries to reason with god and then he starts thinking how do i make god understand it's very difficult so he starts saying if there was some mediator somebody who can mediate on my behalf you know someone who can stand before god and say you know this man is innocent consider his case you know he says i wish i had a mediator we find that in job chapter 9 um that's in um, verses 2 to 35 you know uh, he he says you know god is not just a mere human like me so i can't stand in front of god and start arguing with him i don't have the guts to do that but i wish there was some mediator who can who, you know who can represent me before god and say lord please give this man a second chance someone who can speak on my behalf so he says you know i wish i had somebody like that uh, in verse um 33 job 933 he says if only there was someone to mediate between us and he says in verse 35 then i would speak up without fear of him you know uh, but as it now stands with me i cannot but there is no such mediator so i cannot do that so he's very very disappointed that there is nobody to mediate on his behalf and then from there he you know he starts going into 
bitterness. This is the third stage where in chapters 9 and 10, he says a lot of things which should not be said. So now he's beginning to doubt the faithfulness of God. Okay, so um, we will look at some of those verses a little later. But just to look at Job, Job chapter 10, verses 2 to 3. This is what he says. If someone could read out for us, Job chapter 10, verses 2 to 3. Now here, there's an allegation which Job is making against God. All right. So he says, um, uh, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. No, because you're, you're not telling me what mistake I have made. Because always in the past, you know, God would point out his defect to him and immediately Job would get down on his knees. He would make a burnt offering. He would make a sacrifice. He would confess his sin. So he was always trying to keep a straight, uh, you know, uh, record with God. But now God is not telling him what, is, what the charges are. And uh, so he says, does it please you to oppress me? You know, on the one hand, you're oppressing me. And on the other hand, what do you do? He says, while you smile on the plans of the wicked. Look at the wicked, Lord. They're prospering. They're doing so well. Nothing bad is happening to them. I, on the other hand, who have always been trying to be faithful to you, you're oppressing me. So here, he's actually making an allegation and saying, Lord, the wicked people, you let them do what they want. But me, who am trying to follow you, you are oppressing me. So from there, you know, he starts becoming a little more bitter. Um, and uh, so then, you know, he says, I think it's even if I get killed, it's all right. I think I want to confront God. Earlier, what had he said? He said, I'm scared. You know, I, I wish I had a mediator to mediate on my behalf. But now he's getting carried away. And now he says um, uh, in Job 13 verses 14 to 15, he says, um, why do I put myself in jeopardy and take my life in my hands? It's really risky to start arguing with God. My life is in danger. And then he says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. So it's really dangerous for me to argue with God. But God is a good God. So let me hope in him. Let me actually argue with him. Then maybe God will listen. You know, so he says, I will surely defend my ways to his face. So now he is kind of making up his mind that he wants to confront God and, you know, um, try to argue his case in front of God. Okay, so that's in Job chapter 13. And then from there, he moves to the next stage. Uh, that would be in Job chapter 16, verses 18 to 21. Uh, there he says, Earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. So he's basically saying, I think I'm, I'm going to get killed. You know, God is going to kill me. But when I die, he says to the earth, earth, don't cover up my blood. Let my blood go on crying out for justice. Because if I go on crying out for justice, then somebody in heaven will, will, be, will be one advocate for me. And then they will come and they will defend my case. So even if God kills me, you know, I will continue to cry out for justice. So he's becoming a little um, bitter and a little aggressive in his attitude towards God. Okay, then uh, from there, uh, he moves on to the next stage. Um, maybe we can look at Job 23, verses 3 to 7. In Job 23, 3 to 7, he says, If only I knew where to find God, if only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. And then he says in uh, verse uh, 6, Job 23, verse 6, would he vigorously op oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There the upright one uh, can establish their innocence before him. 
so he still believes in the goodness of god but for some reason god is not responding to him and so he says you know now he's worked up the guts and he says i wish i could go to god's house and you know talk to him face to face then i would be able to present my case and then god would have to listen to me and then you know i would be able to get my justice um uh, and then from there he goes into the final stage which will be job 31 verses 35 to 37 you know i'm just very briefly summarizing obviously there are many many arguments and sub arguments and a lot of explanations but i'm just trying to pick out the main things so that we have a picture of what's going on here all right so now job moves into the final stage job 31 verses 35 to 37 he says i sign now my defense let the almighty answer me let my accuser put his indictment in writing so god seems to be angry about something you know let god put uh, his case against me in writing and give it to me he says i'll wear that indictment as a crown upon my head and i will you know defend myself and say lord you're wrong in the in, in all the things that you're saying about me so he kind of throws a challenge and he says let the almighty answer me now we can sit over here and criticize job and say oh my goodness this man started off by saying you know be uh, let, let the let the name of god be praised and now he's come all the way down to this stage uh, chapter 31 where he's saying let the almighty answer me and the lord and the almighty you know writes down in writing all the things he has against me i'll wear it like a crown and i'll defend my case but when we are going through our trials don't we go through all of these stages we start off by reasoning we say lord why lord are you allowing this have i not been faithful to you lord and then from there you know we start getting angry and we say oh, oh lord the wicked look at them i mean they never even worshiped you they are nicely prospering but lord i who have been faithful why are you oppressing me and then you know from there we can may, maybe move into other stages we you know where we would say oh i wish you know someone would speak on my behalf because god is not listening to me maybe if i go to somebody else and ask them to pray for me then maybe you'll listen to their prayers you're not listening to my prayer these are all very human responses which are you know the deepest most intimate thoughts of job are laid open for us to read in these passages nothing is covered over here what job is feeling in the depths of his heart it's all exposed and laid out for us to see because this is a man who is going through a lot of suffering and is wondering why why i have always confessed my sins lord so why are you doing this why are you not explaining to me what i have done wrong then i'll be able, I'll, i'm more than willing to confess so uh, he still believes in the goodness of god but he is now demanding an explanation and that and then at this point in job chapter 32 you know job chapter 31 it says at the end of job the uh, chapter 31 the words of job are now ended okay so whatever job wanted to say is all finished and now we have the fourth person eli who speaking up and this is what it says about eli who uh, that would be job chapter 32 verses 2 to 3 it says that elihu became very angry with job for justifying himself rather than god and then in the next verse it says he was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute job and yet had condemned him is angry with job because job is saying oh i'm i'm just and right and look at the way god is treating me uh so he is angry with job for having that attitude he is also angry with the friends because they could not find any sin any specific sin and still they have been happily condemning him for so many long speeches so he is angry with both of them and these are the words which elihu speaks it's very interesting because next you're going to have this to the two speeches of god and some of the things which elihu says god says almost the identical things in his speeches So God is pleased with what Elihu is saying about him. Let us look at the th- main things which Elihu says about God. Job thirty four twelve, Elihu says it is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. So Job, you've been saying, oh God has not treated me fairly, but it's unthinkable for God to 
ever do anything unjust is the first declaration which Elihu makes. The next thing that he says, that's in Job 34, 9, he says to Job, Job says there is no profit in trying to please God. You know, so Job is saying, I've been trying, been so faithful to the Lord, but the Lord has not been, uh, you know, um, blessing me. So what is there any profit in following him? And, um, and Elihu says this about Job, he says in Job 34 verses 35 to 36, Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight. Okay. And um, then he, uh, 35, uh, Job 35 verses 2 to 3, if someone could read out, Job 35 verses 2 to 3. Is right, you say, my righteousness is more than false. So you say, what can I confess? What can I Yeah. So here, uh, Elihu says, the way you're talking, is it even correct for you to be talking like this? You're saying, I'm in the right, not God. You know, I'm the one who's right. God is not being right. The way what God is doing, it's not right. That's what you're saying. And he says, is, is this the way to talk to God? And this is what you're, you're in fact saying, what do I gain by not sinning? I mean, should you even be saying any of these things? Okay, so Elihu uh, um, says these things to Job. And then you have uh, um, God. Um, okay, one more, one more statement which Elihu says. He says that God does things which are beyond our understanding. Uh, that would be in Job 36, 26. He says, how great is God beyond our understanding. Again, in Job 37, 5, he says, uh, he does beyond our understanding. And Elihu talks about how God has created uh, amazing things in creation, which we cannot even begin to understand. So uh, God, how can we understand uh, the things that he does? So... Basically, Elihu is saying to Job, you've been very quick to judge and criticize, but God is too big. His creation itself shows how big he is. You know, so it's, he does things beyond our understanding and we cannot always understand what God is, or, you know, is doing. And immediately after Elihu says, comes, you know, completes saying these things, God begins to speak. And God almost says almost the same things which Elihu has been saying. God talks about his creation. God says, do you know how I created uh, the snow? Do you know where I stored the snow? Do you know how rain is formed? If you don't even understand all these natural things which are happening here on the earth, how will you understand things which are happening in the other spiritual realm? You're, you're asking questions about things which you, uh, when you cannot even understand physical things, are you, how are you going to understand supernatural things? Because God knows what has happened in the background in the spiritual realm. And uh, Job is not even aware of those things. So, um, you know, um, th that is basically what God refers to. So the main thing which God seems to be very, very upset about is this. Because Job said that God supports wickedness and he oppresses the righteous. Okay, so this is something that Job has, had said earlier in chapters 9 and 10. In Job 9, 21 to 24, this is something which Job says. He says that God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. Um, and um, he says he mocks the despair of the innocent. And then in verse 24, he says, he, he blindfolds the, you know, the, 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 the judges of this world. It's like as if God is blindfolding the judges so that any, any amount of wickedness can go on. These are direct allegations that Job makes regarding the righteousness of God. The, the, the purity and holiness and justice of God. He's, you know, these are statements that he makes against God. And so now, 
God speaks just the way Elihu said earlier, right? Elihu says, um, Job speaks without knowledge. His words lack insight is what Elihu says in 34 uh, verse 35. So here, God says something very similar in verse 38 verse 2. And the Lord says, who is, that, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? So God says, you are talking without any knowledge. You're talking out of your ignorance. And then God goes on to say in uh, verse uh, chapter 40, verse 2, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Earlier, Job had thrown the challenge at the end of his entire you know, dialogue in chapter 31. He said, let the Almighty answer me. Now God says, you answer me first. If you can answer me, then I'll answer you. And God starts asking him about creation. And he's, he doesn't even know how creation has happened. So when he can't even understand human things, how is he going to understand supernatural things? And so the end of that, you know, um, yeah, he, he, he repents, Job repents. So in, in uh, 40 verse 8, God says, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? You're saying that I'm not just... You're saying that I don't, uh, that I allow the wicked to get away with whatever they want and I oppress the blameless. That is what you are saying about me. Uh, you know, and uh, so at the end of that dialogue, um, Job says, uh, God also says in, in chapter 40, verses 13 and 14, he says, if you think that you're so great and you know how to handle the wicked people, uh, he's in verse Chapter 40, verse 13 to 14, if someone can read out. This is what God says. Chapter 40, verses 13 and 14. So uh, God says to Job, you seem to think that, uh, you know, you know everything. Uh, how to handle, how the wicked should be handled, how justice should be given. And God says over here, if you're that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're that knowledgeable, why don't you try to give justice? No, he says, bury all the wicked in the dust. And then he says, then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Because Job has been saying, God, you're oppressing the innocent. You're not giving justice. You know, so the Lord says, uh, if you think you can do it on your own, go ahead and do it. Then I will admit to you that you can save yourself. And then Job responds and he says in chapter 40, verses 4 to 5, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? Uh, and then and he says, I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. So he admits and says, yes, Lord, I do not have any answer to the questions which you have put. And then God starts off his second speech. And in the second speech, God talks about two powerful creatures which he has created. One is called the behemoth and the other is called the leviathan. Uh, there are a lot of theories about which animals these are. We don't need to get into those details. But the point that God is making is, I know how to control things which are in power. I created these two powerful creatures and no human is, knows how to control them, but I have perfect control over them. You know, um, uh, he says about the behemoth, he says, I can, um, I can walk up to it uh, with, my, with my sword or arrow or something, he says, with my rod or something, he says. You know, no, no person can even approach these creatures, but I, I can handle them. So I know how to take care of the wicked. I know how to establish justice. You know, it's the point which God is trying to make. And then at the end of the second speech, Job says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can ever be thwarted. So if Lord, if you decide to do something, it will be done. So he finally admits and says, yes, Lord, I was very confused. I was very wrong. But Lord, what you decide, you will fulfill. And so you, you know, he admits that he is wrong. And so at the end of this, this is what God says about Job and about the three friends. 
which you will find in your Job chapter 42. Um, I think that would be verse uh, 7, where uh, the Lord says, uh, the Lord says to the friends, he says, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has Okay, so Job also spoke wrong about God, but then he repents and he says, Lord, what I said was all foolishness. I spoke without knowledge. I have no answer. And he says, now I realize that once you purpose to do something, your purposes cannot be put off. You will fulfill whatever you decide. So Job spoke, finally speaks right about God. He uh, repents of his sinful speech and he humbles himself and repents. So now the Lord says to the friends, it's your turn. You said things about me which are not correct. According to you, God brings suffering only upon the uh, wicked. But that is not true. God has got higher purposes like Elihu says, his ways are beyond our understanding. There are things which God does which we may not be able to understand. So God says, you also, you three friends, you also need to offer burnt sacrifices and repent of the sin which you have done in speaking wrong about me. So this entire book of Job is mainly about the character of God, who God is. And when we start understanding what God is saying about himself, are we willing to repent, get down on our knees and say, Lord, you are right, I am wrong. So you see, Job also, in his humanness, in his confusion, he said a lot, lot of things. He made wrong allegations. But finally, when the Lord showed himself and showed who he was, you know, that's what he says, right? I have, uh, he says, earlier I had heard about you. Now I have seen you. And he says, I know, I shut my mouth. So when the Lord reveals who he is, Job confesses. And he gets down on his knees and admits and says, Lord, you are worthy of worship. You know? So he, at the end of the story, he admits that God is indeed a God of justice. And God indeed knows what he is doing. And the Lord's ways are beyond our understanding. And our attitude should be one of submission, where we say, Lord, you are right in all that you do. And whether I understand it or not, I submit. To you. So this entire book of Job is about the character of God. Satan starts off the story with an allegation where he says, you are not worthy of worship. And, and God says, here is a man who even though he's going to go through a long process of suffering and say all kinds of things, he will hold on to the basic belief that I will, you know, help him. Because he says, right, even though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. And in another place, he says, if I could find out where God lives and go and present my case, will he oppose me? No, no, he will not oppose me. He, in fact, he will justify me. So at the bottom of it all, ultimately, Job had this belief that if he could just present his case in the correct way, then God will defend him. So he never um, you know, turned his back on God. He went through a lot of questioning. He went through a lot of confusion, but at the end of it, he repents and he admits that God is God. God is sovereign. And what God does, God does right. So, and the friend, the three friends also, they repent, you know, they offer the burnt sacrifices. Uh, Job uh, intercedes on their behalf. And uh, so at the end of the book of Job, the character of God is established as being just as being good, as being right. Okay, so um, Job is a book which is helpful for people, righteous people, who are going through a time of great suffering. There are things happening to you and your family that you just don't understand. You know, because the basic sermon which is preached from the pulpit is that if you follow the Lord, you know, if you claim uh, your position in Christ, then everything will fall into place. But so many times we go through situations where things are not falling into place. And then all these questions which Job went through in his mind, 
we through go through those same questions which is why all these things are clearly put down in the book of job the things which went through his mind those same thoughts go through our minds and so when those questions go through our minds what should be the conclusion we finally come to job chapter uh, you know chapters 38 onwards where god starts speaking and we just like job we get down on our knees and we say lord it's true i don't understand why things are not working the way i thought they're supposed to work but you are good you are sovereign and like job i will shut my mouth and you know allow you to be god you do it your way i will submit so um in job there is no white washing the heart of job is clearly exposed all the confusion that he's going through is clearly shown for us because we too go through the same things but like job at the end of the book we at the end of i know our story we should be able to get down and say on our, on our knees and say lord you are god you are sovereign when you what purposes you have planned they will come to pass so i do i don't need to worry about myself and my family whatever you have planned for my family and me it shall come to pass god wants an attitude of trust so um what job did in criticizing god that was wrong eli who said what you the way you're speaking you're, it's, it is wrong he says you're speaking words without knowledge god also says the same thing he says who is this person who's who's obscuring my plans you know he's acting like as if he knows more than me about my plans and job finally says i know nothing lord and i you know i repent in dust and ashes is what he says so the book of job teaches us the right attitude to have when we are going through a confusing time where all the things which have been preached from the pulpit are not happening in our family the you know we are, we are we are trying to do everything the right way and it doesn't seem to be working and we don't understand what is going on at such times the best thing is to humble ourselves before god and say lord your ways are beyond our understanding but unlike job who you know kind of got shaken for a little bit we will not make that mistake we will you know even before god can come and correct us we will get down on our knees and say lord you are god you know what is best uh, so um he, he uh, this is what job says um he says i am unworthy how can i reply to you uh, he says i spoke once but i have no answer and then uh, at the end of the second speech he says i know that you can do all things no purpose of yours can be thwarted okay and he goes on to say surely i spoke of things i did not understand things too wonderful for me to know and then he says my ears had heard of you but now my eyes have seen you therefore i despise myself and repent in dust and ashes that is the attitude that god expects of us matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30 this you know um are the verses upon which i have decided to stand because god does some sometimes works in our life in such a way that we just can't understand but the lord says you may be weary you may be burdened come to me i will give you rest the lord says take my yoke upon you and learn from me i won't do things the way you want them done i will do things my sovereign way are you willing to take my yoke upon you and learn from me or are you going to be like job and criticize and grumble and doubt and be confused no our lord and master the one to whom we have come for salvation for eternal life he is our master he is our teacher and he says uh, come to me i will give you rest and how are you going to find rest for your soul by taking my yoke upon you and learning from me i'm going to teach you new things you have never learned you know things may not be working out the way they are supposed to you know 1 plus 1 may not always add up to 2 things are going differently for you but are you willing to take my yoke upon you and learn from me if you do so 
you will discover that I am gentle and humble in spirit, in heart. The, the, our Lord and Master, He is not cruel. He is not oppressive. He is not unjust. He is humble and gentle in the way He leads us. So no matter what we are going through, we need to have that attitude of submission and trust where we say, Lord, you are humble and gentle in your dealings with me. So I will take your yoke upon me and learn from you the way Job was willing to learn from you in the end. All right. So uh, those are the, uh, the, the uh, that could be the takeaway for us from the uh, book of Job. Let's just quickly close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for the lessons that we could learn today from the book of Esther and from the book of Job, O oh Lord. In the book of Esther, we looked at commitment, whether things go well for us or whether things do not go well for us. Just like Esther, O oh Lord, help us to take a stand for you, for your purposes. Because, O oh Lord, you will do what is right. You will do what is best for your people. And Lord, uh, thank you for the book of, we thank you, O oh Lord, for the book of Job. Because, Lord, the, the confusion that went through his mind, it goes through our minds as well when we suffer. But, Lord, because of the book of Job, we can confidently say that you are sovereign, you know best, and what you have planned for us, it will come to pass. So we can trust you and wait upon you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.